Good morning. This is the lecture covering leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. We're going to first cover leukemia. This particular cancer occurs in all age groups. It is when there is an accumulation of dysfunctional cells due to loss of regulation in cell division. This type of cancer is fatal if it is untreated. Here the cells have lost their ability to differentiate into white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. When a patient presents, their white blood cell counts are very low, or excuse me, are very high, and the platelet and hemoglobin levels are low. It is now known that all cancers begin with mutation in their DNA. In addition, there is an increased incidence of leukemia in radiologists, persons who have lived near nuclear bomb test sites or nuclear reactor accidents, such as what we've seen with Chernobyl, and those persons who have been previously treated with radiation therapy or chemotherapy. This shows that there is not just one single cause for someone developing leukemia, but that it can be a combination of genetic and environmental influences that occur. Um, this just kind of shows you the pathophysiology of leukemia. You actually see a pro proliferation of immature white blood cells, um, malignant. You will see blast cells when they look at a slide of the cells. Um, the bone marrow, you have that failure. Um, you no longer, they are no longer producing the erythrocytes. The patient will present with anemia. They'll be weak. They'll be pale. Um, the lymphocytes, they have immunosuppression. They develop infections very easily. Um, they may present with fever. Um, you have a reduction in the platelet production. Um, they bleed easily. They have a decrease in their clotting. Um, they present with thrombocytopenia. Um, a big presentation on these folks is that you'll see petechiae um, all over, bruising, and purpura. Um, when the cells infiltrate outside of the bone marrow, the most common sites are brain, um, and you will see, like in the testicles, um, other sites of involvement include the lymph nodes, liver, spleen, and joints um, for metastasis or other involvement um, with leukemia cells. Um, acute leukemias um, does develop very rapidly. Um, it's characterized by the ineffective immature cells in the bone marrow. They actually crowd out and prevent the development of normal cells. Um, the signs and symptoms are actually nonspecific. Again, your patient presents, they have anemia, they will be neutropenic and have thrombocytopenia. Um, they may be pale, they may complain of headache, be very fatigued, um, have a loss of appetite, they may have some weight loss. Um, shortness of breath, but you will see the petechiae. A lot of these patients present um, with petechiae covering. They become, they bruise very easily, and they may have some splenomegaly as well. Um, any type of minor trauma can cause them to bruise. Um, even just touching their skin um, can cause a bruise. Um, Bone tenderness, they may complain of some bone pain and bone tenderness along the long bones, ribs, and sternum um, can also occur as the leukemic cells expand into the intramedullary space or invade the periosteum um, for these patients. As these normal cells um, may still develop, the patient's health may not be as affected as severely until the advanced stages um, on someone who has chronic leukemias. Um, these actually progress more slowly, and they rarely affect anyone under the age of 20. Um, and it actually still allows normal cells to develop um, in the chronic leukemia um, they do, because they are more slow in their progression. 
Leukemias are um, classified based on the type of white blood cell that is affected. Um, I'm not going to test you on all the different types of leukemias. Um, just be aware of how they are classified and whether it's an acute or chronic type of leukemia. Um, acute lymphocytic, of course, because it is, affects the lymphocytes. Um, myelogenous, because it um, affects the myocytes. Um, and then your acute non-lymphoblastic leukemias. Um, and then you have the chronics that go along with that. Um, you can um, review your table um, 3124 for more details about the different subtypes of leukemias. But as I said, I'm not going to test you specifically on the different types. Um, they all basically present the same um, for a patient. Um, and again, the way they differentiate it is when they look at a slide or a blood smear, um, the pathologist or the um, surgical oncologist or oncologist will actually look at, or the hematologist will actually look at the slide, the peripheral smear, to um, diagnose which type of um, leukemia it is. Um, clinical manifestations again are very varied. Um, again, because they have the bone marrow failure that we've already discussed because of the overcrowding um, by the abnormal cells. And so you have the inadequate production of normal marrow elements. Um, the formation of leukemic infiltrates occurs. And again, um, reviewing um, your table in chapter um, 30, um, 24 um, will help with that on page 636. When we look at um, your inadequate marrow elements, um, again, we already talked about the patient presents with anemia, um, thrombocytopenia, um, you have a decreased number and function of white blood cells that occur. And as it progresses, you have fewer blood cells produced. Um, the abnormal white blood cells actually accumulate because they do not go through the normal cell life cycle to death. And they continue to accumulate and clump. And they can actually um, go on into con infiltrating organs um, so that you see the splenomegaly that occurs and the hepatomegaly that occurs as well. Um, with the patient. Leukemic cells um, can cause lymphadenopathy um, when you palpate or when patients have scans done they'll actually notice um, enlarged lymph nodes. Um, your patient will complain of bone pain. They may have some meningeal irritation that occurs because again you have the clumping of the white blood cells and that causes a slowing of the CNS fluid or the um, lumbar spinal fluid um, cannot easily progress through the system um, almost kind of like with meningitis and so you have the um, neck pain and inability to be able to move the neck as well patient may um, develop some oral lesions, um, may even have some solid masses that occur, um, what we call um, chloromas. Um, and again, this is actual collections of those leukemic cells that have occurred. Um, leukocytosis is a very life-threatening complication. And again, it's caused by high leukemic white cell count in the peripheral blood. Um, the blood actually thickens and it can actually block circulatory pathways. Um, the leukemic white blood cell, or excuse me, yes, white cell count in the peripheral blood is um, normally greater than 100,000. Um, when your patient presents, um, if you see white counts in the 100,000s, um, this is a red flag that this patient is likely um, presenting with a type of leukemia. Um, as that is not something you would see normally with infections um, that occur. <clears throat> um, we look at diagnosing 
um, for the different types. Um, your, pay, your physician's going to order a CBC with a blood smear. They're going to look at the cells under a microscope. This helps to give a more definitive diagnosis for what type of leukemia your patient has. And it also helps to determine the treatment for this patient. Um, they're going to order a bone marrow aspiration to be done um, to help confirm the diagnosis. Um, other studies that can be done, they may do a lumbar puncture. Um, they're going to do a CT scan um, to detect leukemic cells outside of the blood or the bone marrow um, as well um, in looking at diagnosing and looking at prognosis for your patient. Um, the initial goal um, in the collaborative care and with leukemia is to attain remission on, for the patient. You can either have complete remission, partial, or what we call a molecular um, remission. Um, the patient's prognosis is directly related to the ability to maintain remission. Um, and as the patient relapses, their prognosis becomes more um, unfavorable. Um, the age and cytogenetic analysis often help form the basis of important treatment decisions. Um, in some cases, such as non-symptomatic patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, um, a watchful waiting is kind of done um, with active supportive care um, may be seen as the most appropriate for this type of patient. Um, although the patient may not be cured, um, attaining the remission or the disease control is a realistic option for the majority of patients. Um, in some cases, cure is a realistic goal. In complete remission, um, no evidence of overt disease is found on physical examination, and the bone marrow and peripheral blood sphere appear normal. In a partial remission, this is characterized by a lack of symptoms and a normal peripheral blood smear. But evidence of disease may still be seen in the bone marrow. Minimal residual disease is defined as tumor cells that cannot be detected by morphologic examination, but can be identified by molecular testing. When we talk about molecular remission, it indicates that all molecular studies are negative for any residual leukemia on the patient. So when they're doing chemotherapy to try and bring the patient into remission, there are different stages that occur. The initial stage is called induction therapy. Um, in induction therapy, there's an attempt to bring about that remission. Um, here, they administer high doses of chemotherapy, and they administer them very close together. Um, then after that, they do administer once a month. It is aggressive. Um, leukemic cells are destroyed in the tissues, peripheral blood and bone marrow to eventually restore normal hematopoiesis. These patients can become critically ill as the bone marrow is severely depressed. Nursing interventions focus on neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia. Um, these patients have to be protected from um, outside sources of infection. Um, it's very important, hand washing is very important, um, making sure that um, visitors and other people do not come in that are sick and that they all um, utilize good hand washing and hand hygiene. Um, also need to provide a lot of psychosocial support. Sometimes these patients are put into isolation while they're undergoing the induction therapy. Um, as a protection for them. Um, during post-induction or post-remission, um, here high-dose therapy may be given immediately after induction therapy for several months. Um, this is also known as intensification therapy. Um, consolidation therapy is started after remission is achieved. This can consist of one or two additional courses of the same drug or high-dose therapy. The purpose of this 
is to eliminate any remaining leukemic cells. And from here, the patient will be placed on what we call a maintenance therapy. This includes treatment with lower doses of the same drug that was used in the induction or other drugs given every three to four weeks for a prolonged period. This is done in an effort to keep the body free of any leukemic cells. As we are talked about, um, when we look at oncologic emergencies, when you think about these leukemic cells being um, destroyed rapidly, um, these patients are at high risk um, for tumor lysis syndrome. So when you review that in the article, keep that in mind as you're listening to this, that these patients have to be monitored very closely because again, those cells are rupturing and all of those elements, the DNA, um, potassium, all of those types of things that are within cells are being released into the system at a very rapid rate and in large numbers um, and that can put these patients at high risk for these complications. Um, combination therapy um, or chemotherapy is the um, mainstay of treatment for these patients. Purposes, um, of course, are to decrease drug resistance, um, decrease drug toxicity when they use multiple drugs, and again, it also interrupts the cell growth um, at multiple points, um, depending on the age of the cell, um, whether it's in a resting phase or it's still in a very active phase. Um, the different types of chemo hit these cells at those different stages um, to destroy them and to eliminate them. In addition to chemotherapy, um, they may also use corticosteroids to help decrease inflammation. Um, there may also, depending on if there's some lymphadenopathy or lymph, no lymph node involvement or some bone, other types of involvement, organ or field specific, um, may also include radiation therapy for the patient. Um, this can also be utilized if they're looking at doing um, bone marrow transplantation for the patient. Um, again, they have to destroy any of the bad marrow um, to look at trying to replace that um, when the patient is ready. Um, when they do decide on doing um, any kind of hematopoietic stem cell transplant, here the goal is to totally eliminate the leukemic cells. Um, they're going to use a combination of chemo with or without total body irradiation. Um, and so then they're going to get ready to do the replacement um, with a stem cell transplant. Um, it'll either be from a matching sibling or a volunteer donor, um, which is an allogenic, or it could be their own stem cells if they're able to save um, and bring out any um, healthy stem cells, which is autologous, um, before the intensive therapy was done. Um, they can do a replacement in that way. Um, primary complications for these, for those who have an allogenic um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant or graft versus donor disease um, and they can also have relapse of leukemia and of course they can develop infection as well um, from this. Um, when you look at your assessment from a nursing standpoint, um, your subjective data you want to know if you look at table 3026 um, their past health history, have they been exposed to any toxins, have they had chemo chemotherapy in the past or any surgery or radiation treatments in the past, um, as this kind of gives you little checkoffs for what could be occurring um, with the patient. You also want to look at um, your objective, have they been running a fever, do they have any um, lymphadenopathy, have they been fatigued or lethargic. Um, what does the skin look like? Do they have petechiae? Do they have a lot of bruising? Um, are they pale? Um, cardiovascular, again, because they could be presenting as very anemic. Um, are they tachycardic as the body tries to compensate? Um, do you hear any extra heart sounds? Are there any murmurs? 
um, gastrointestinal? Do they have any oral lesions? Do they have any bleeding? Um, any other host infections because of the immunosuppression that they've experienced? Um, do they have any hepatomegaly or splenomegaly that has occurred? When we look at the fact that leukemic cells can invade brain, um, have they experienced any seizures? Are they having any disorientation or any confusion? Do they have muscle wasting? Are they complaining of bone or joint pain that can be occurring um, at this time? Diagnostically, um, we're going to look at their white blood cell count. We're going to look at their entire CBC, but we're going to look what is the white blood cell count. Could be normal, maybe abnormal. Are they anemic? Do they have thrombocytopenia? Um, the Philadelphia chromosome. When we talk about the Philadelphia chromosome, um, this is actually kind of a translocation um, of a specific genetic abnormality in chromosome 22 of leukemia cells, um, particularly chronic myelogenous leukemia. Um, this is what they will see um, on some of these patients sometimes. It's, there's been a translocation or an abnormality um, in that chromosome um, that is present. Um, it's a highly sensitive test for chronic um, myelogenous um, leukemia um, since about 95% of those patients will have this particular chromosome and abnormality um, that has occurred. Um, hypercellular bone marrow aspirate or a biopsy will also be done and those will show um, what type of cells are involved. So we have to look at emotional issues, um, encourage your patient to discuss their feelings, um, provide reassurance and support, um, teach relaxation techniques, and encourage support groups or a counselor for these patients. Um, if the patient is taking prednisone, advise them to take it with breakfast or lunch to prevent insomnia, and to notify the oncologist or hematologist if they have mood changes. You also need to teach your patient about the risk for infection, what signs and symptoms to monitor for, and when to contact the physician regarding. Tell them about the potential for hair loss with the chemotherapy and explain that their hair will probably grow back once therapy is completed. You need to refer them to the appropriate programs so that that can be assisted with wigs. Um, explain to them that their skin can become dry and become more sensitive to sunlight, so they will need to wear sunblock and wear protective clothing when they're out in the sun. Encourage the patient to pace their activities. Um, rest frequently to help um, reduce the symptoms of fatigue. You need to discuss the potential for chemotherapy-induced sterility. For males, discuss, review, um, the need to prevent pregnancy in their partner because chromosome damage to sperm can negatively affect the fetus. Um, talk with them about um, sperm banking and provide the resource information to them. Um, female patients need to be taught that um, treatment can cause menstrual changes and menopause-like symptoms and make them more susceptible to vaginal infections. Um, younger females may want to bank their eggs or freeze their eggs or um, prior to treatments um, as they may be um, unable to get pregnant later on. Um, stomatitis, encourage your patient to see a dentist before starting chemotherapy. Um, they need to know to rinse their mouth with a solution of salt and baking soda and water to prevent infection and advise against drinking alcohol or utilizing any alcohol-based mouth rinses. Um, patient needs to drink plenty of fluids um, and void frequently to prevent cystitis. They need to check their urine for blood and to call if this occurs as well as if they develop frequency or discomfort with urination. Teach them to include fiber in their diet and encourage them to use a laxative if they cannot defecate every two days. And they will need to contact their health care provider if they develop diarrhea. 
If the patient is taking prednisone, um, encourage them to take it with food or milk. If they experience mid-epigastric distress, they need to contact their health care provider regarding. So we're now going to talk about lymphoma for the patient. Um, when we talk about lymphoma, it is a neoplastic disease in which lymphocytes undergo malignant change and produce tumors in the lymphoid tissue. Um, sharing common characteristics of lymphadenopathy, um, various lymphomas are classified as either Hodgkin's disease and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We're going to first talk about Hodgkin's lymphoma. The incidence of Hodgkin's lymphoma is increased among those who have um, HIV. Um, causes still remain unknown. Some key factors um, is that if you've been infected with the Epstein-Barr virus, you're at higher risk. Um, there is some genetic predisposition and also with exposure to occupational toxins can increase incidence. Hodgkin's disease develops in a single lymph node or chain of nodes, which then spreads to adjoining nodes. The main diagnostic feature of Hodgkin's lymphoma is the presence of Reed Sternberg cells in lymph node biopsy specimens. When the disease begins above the diaphragm, it remains confined to lymph nodes for a variable time. When the disease begins below the diaphragm, it spreads to extra lymphoid sites such as the liver. Um, it has an insidious onset. You will see enlargement of cervical, axillary, or inguinal lymph nodes. The second most common location is a mediastinal node mass. And a lot of times um, they will do PET scans um, for these folks. Um, looking um, for where the locations are, and it's a lot of times they will find um, the mediastinal masses um, initially on these um, patients. Um, this is an example, it's an extreme example of an enlarged cervical lymph node. Um, I really can't imagine anyone allowing this um, to get this large. Um, and you have a um, figure 3013, which also shows a enlarged cervical lymph node in the neck of someone. Um, but on this, you can see in here um, the enlarged area here um, around, excuse me, didn't mean to produce. Um, in here, you can see the lymph nodes right here in the cervical area of the neck and along the back of the neck of the patient um, that are enlarged. Um, using diagnostic studies, um, they will stage the disease in order to determine um, the presence or absence of any systemic symptoms. Um, and then it's either indicated as an A like stage A, stage B, um, A, 2A, 1A, and when they put an A on that, it means that there are no systemic symptoms that are occurring. If they stage it as stage 2B, that means systemic symptoms are present in the patient. Um, the disease can be localized or it can be diffuse. And final staging is based on the clinical stage, um, or meaning the extent of the disease, as well as whether or not there is presence of B symptoms. Um, treatment will depend on the nature and the extent of the disease. When we look at it in stage one of Hodgkin's disease, um, the involvement is still just in a single lymph node. Um, the patient will have unexplained fever. They may have some night sweats may have some malaise and some generalized pruritus that occurs. When we talk about stage two, there's usually involvement of two or more lymph nodes on one side of the diaphragm. In stage three, there is lymph node involvement above and below the diaphragm. In stage four, there is involvement outside of the diaphragm, such as the liver, 
the bone, marrow, and the lung. Additional features such as an elevated sedimentation rate can occur, um, especially when you see a patient age greater than or equal to 45 years. Um, it's more common in the male gender for Hodgkin's lymphoma and presence of a large mediastinal mass and low serum albumin. The hemoglobin can be low and you can have low or high lymphocyte counts can move this person from an early stage one or two to an unfavorable prognosis as well, which can warrant more aggressive therapy for the patient than initially would be needed if these symptoms were not present. Um, in Hodgkin's lymphoma, on the clinical manifestations, um, the nodes remain movable, they're non-tender, um, they're painless unless the nodes actually exert pressure on any adjacent nerves, and as they become larger, they may be putting pressure on the nerves. Patient may experience some weight loss, some fatigue and weakness, um, fever and chills, um, some tachycardia, and again, some night sweats may occur. When we talk about the B symptoms, um, Again, the initial symptoms correlate with a worse prognosis. Um, the things that we call B symptoms is fevers greater than 100.4, drenching, night sweats, and a weight loss that exceeds 10% in six months. Um, for some reason, with Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, after ingestion of even small amounts of alcohol, um, individuals will complain of a rapid onset of pain. Um, at the site of the disease. Um, this is cause of this. Um, Alcohol-induced pain is really unknown. Um, it just particularly occurs for some reason. Um, they will have generalized pruritus, um, but there will be no lesions present um, that occur. Um, if there is some mediastinal node involvement, um, your patient may have a cough. They may have some dyspnea, some stridor, or some dysphagia, again, as that enlarged mediastinal node is causing some compression there on the nerves and on any of the other um, chest area or thoracic involvement. In advanced cases, there can be hepatomegaly, splenomegaly. Um, you will see anemia, and again, of course, you can see physical signs depending on the disease location. Um, we look at other physical signs as in when they have intrathoracic involvement. Um, the patient may actually ha end up with superior vena cava syndrome because of the compression. It can cause um, episodes of where um, you have the decrease in the venous return and an actual blockage of the superior vena cava syndrome. In enlarged retroperitoneal nodes, it can actually cause palpable abdominal masses, which can interfere with renal function for the patient. Um, patient could have jaundice when there's liver involvement. Um, when there's spinal cord compression due to involvement there, um, it could lead to paraplegia, which could occur with extradural involvement. Bone pain can occur as a result of bone involvement for your patient. Leukopenia and thrombocytopenia can develop, but they are usually a consequence of treatment, advanced disease, or superimposed hypersplenism. Radiologic evaluation can help to define all the sites of involvement and determine the clinical stage of the disease. Um, the positron emission tomography or PET scan with or without CT scans is used to stage and then assess the response to therapy. It also helps to differentiate residual tumor from fibrotic um, masses um, after the patient has received treatment. Management um, primarily focuses on selecting a treatment plan, um, least amount to achieve cure, and minimize short and long-term complications for the patient. Again, they do use combination chemotherapy um, favorable early stage disease, they get about two to four different cycles. Unfavorable early stage can get up to four to six cycles, and in advance they can get six to eight cycles. 
Um, the standard for chemo um, is what they call the ABVD regimen, which is um, doxorubicin, which is adriamycin, the bleomycin, vinblastine, and dacorbazine. Um, in advanced stages, for advanced stage, um, the common regimen is bleomycin, um, etopopside, adriamycin, um, cyclophosphamide, vincristine, procarbazine, and prednisone. Um, no, I'm not going to test you on the specific treatments, but that's just um, giving you an idea of how many different types of drugs they're going to hit them with for this types of um, lymphoma. Um, they can do intensive chemotherapy with or without the use of autologous or allogenic um, hemo hemopoietic stem cell transplant, and they are also may use the hematopoietic growth factors. Um, can be the treatment of choice um, for advanced refractory or relapsed Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, we discussed in regards to relapsed, we're talking stages 3B and 4 for these patients when they're using that. Um, radiation can be used as a supplement. It will vary on whether they use it. It will depend on where um, the site of the disease is at and whether or not there's still any presence after they've received chemotherapy. Um, the response to therapy is determined by um, repeat CT and repeat PET scans, and they may actually do another bone marrow biopsy to see how the response has been for the patient. Um, there is a variety of chemotherapy regimens and some newer agents that are being utilized for these patients who have relapsed or have refractory disease. Um, they hope that once remission is obtained, um, a hope for curative options may be intensive chemotherapy um, with the use of um, stem cell transplant. Um, stem cell transplant has allowed patients to receive higher and potentially curative doses of chemotherapy. Um, while reducing life-threatening leukopenia. Um, combination chemotherapy works well because as we saw in leukemia, drugs are used that have an additive anti-tumor effect without increasing the side effects that they um, experience. Therapy um, has to be aggressive. Um, there can be some potentially life-threatening problems. Um, in an attempt to achieve the remission um, and maintenance chemotherapy does not contribute to the increased survival um, once complete remission has been achieved. Occasionally single drugs, drugs can be used or administered palliatively to patients who cannot tolerate intensive combination therapy. Uh, and a serious consequent of the treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma is that they can develop secondary malignancies later as well as potential long-term toxicities from their treatment, such as endocrine, cardiac, and pulmonary dysfunction. Adriamycin is one of those very cardiac um, toxic drugs, and so they can have a lot of cardiac complications later on um, in relation to side effects from that drug. The risk of secondary malignancies is about 5% and generally occur within the first 10 years after their treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, it's most commonly, um, common secondary malignancies you'll see are acute myelogenous leukemia, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and sometimes solid tumors can occur. When you look at your nursing and collaborative management, um, if these patients do receive radiation. Um, need to make sure the skin in the radiation field is taken care of. Monitor their psychosocial considerations and again the fertility issues that occur. And overall better prognosis than many cancers. Um, nursing care for Hodgkin's lymphoma is based primarily and largely on managing the problems related to the disease, um, such as pain due to the tumor, um, complications of severe vena cava syndrome, pancytopenia, and other side effects of the therapy. 
Because the survival of patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma depends on their response to treatment, supporting the patient through the consequences of treatment is very important. The prognosis for Hodgkin's lymphoma is better than that for many forms of cancer or leukemia, but the psychosocial considerations are just as important as they are with leukemia. The physical, psychological, social, and spiritual consequences of the patient's disease must be addressed. Fertility issues may be of particular concern because this disease is frequently seen in adolescents and our young adults. Help to ensure that these issues have been addressed soon after the patient has been diagnosed. Again, um, discuss with them about sperm banking and freezing um, eggs. Evaluation of pa patients for long-term effects of therapy is important because delayed consequences of disease and treatment may not be apparent for years. So now we're going to talk about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, this is a heterogeneous um, group of malignant neoplasms of the immune system. It can affect all ages. Um, B cell lymphomas constitute about 85% of all the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, there will be no Reed Sternberg cells on biopsy. This is what distinguishes between Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It is classified by the level of differentiation, where the cell originates, and the rate of proliferation for the cell. Um, it can vary from a slow to a rapid disease progression. Um, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is the most commonly occurring hematologic cancer and the fifth leading cause of cancer death. There's about a little over 66,000 new cases each year and about 19,000 deaths occur due to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma yearly. Um, some viruses and bacteria are actually implicated in the pathogenesis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, including human T-cell leukemia virus type 1, the Epstein-Barr virus, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, your H. pylori um, are just a few examples. Environmental factors that are linked to the development of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma include chemicals such as pesticides, herbicides, solvents, organic chemicals, and wood preservatives as a part of this. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is most common in those who have an inherited immunodeficiency syndrome have used immunosuppressive medications, or received chemo or radiation in the past. For example, small lymphocytic lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia result from malignant proliferation of small B lymphocytes, with chronic lymphocytic leukemia having the majority of disease within the bone marrow as compared with the lymph nodes. Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, the most common aggressive lymphoma, is a neoplasm that originates in the lymph nodes, usually in the neck or abdomen. Burkitt's lymphoma is the most highly aggressive disease and is thought to originate from B-cell blast in the lymph nodes. In non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's widely disseminated disease. It's usually present at the time that the patient is diagnosed. They have painless lymph node enlargement, and that is their primary clinical manifestation. The lymphadenopathy can wax and wane. And because the disease is usually disseminated when it is diagnosed, other symptoms will be present, depending on where the disease has spread. They could have hepatomegaly with liver involvement. They can also have neurologic symptoms if they have CNS disease. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can also manifest in nonspecific ways, such as an airway obstruction, hyperuricemia, and renal failure from tumor lysis syndrome. 
They could also present with pericardial tamponade and they could present with gastrointestinal complaints as well. Patients with high-grade lymphomas, you'll see lymphadenopathy and you'll also see the B symptoms of the fever, and the night sweats, and the significant weight loss, the 10% in six months or greater than 10% in six months. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is classified based on the morphologic, genetic, and immunophenotypic cell surface antigens and the clinical features that are seen. Um, precise histologic subtype um, identification is extremely important. Um, a lymph node biopsy established the cell type and the pattern. And unfortunately, the prognosis for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is not as good as that for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Identifying what category along with the gene expression patterns is useful in determining what type of therapy is going to be done for these patients. Additional factors known as the International Prognosis Index may be considered for each subtype to help select the appropriate treatment for these patients. Factors that are considered may include the clinical stage, the number of extranodal sites, the serum lactate dehydrogenase, their white blood cell count, the hemoglobin, and the patient's age and performance status. Immunologic, cytogenetic, and molecular studies are also useful <clears throat> in helping to make these therapeutic decisions and also in assessing the prognosis of the patient. They may also um, do studies um, looking to see if there's any tumor lysis, and they will also screen for hepatitis, HIV, and H. pylori. Um, skin biopsies and bone marrow biopsies and lumbar punctures may also be done to help with the prognosis and um, treatment decisions. Treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma normally includes not only chemotherapy, but may also include combination of radiation therapy. There is a table 3029 on page 644. I'm not going to test you on specific combinations of drugs, but just know that in the different types that there can be combination of chemo and radiation for treatment. More aggressive lymphomas are actually more responsive to treatment and are also more likely to be cured, which is in contrast to the indolent lymphomas that have a naturally long course but are very difficult to treat. Patients with low-grade indolent lymphoma can live up to 10 years or more without treatment. Some initial therapies can be well tolerated and have been shown to reduce the time to progression of the disease. Lymphomas that are infectious driven, such as H. pylori gastric lymphomas, may be treated with antibiotic or antiviral therapy. Use radiation precautions when you're caring for patients and you need to teach your patients about safety issues and how to minimize risk of radiation exposure to staff and to others and to their family members. Um, review this in the chapter on radiation treatment um, for the oncology chapter. Um, complete remission is uncommon for these patients but they will have an improvement in symptoms um, in the majority of the patients that are treated. Our care is largely based on managing problems related to the disease, again the pancytopenia and the other side effects. Problems related to the disease may include pain caused by the tumor, spinal cord compression, or tumor lysis syndrome. Because non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can be more extensive and involve specific organs, such as the central nervous system, spleen, liver, GI tract, or bone marrow, it is important to understand the subtype and the extent of the disease. And this can be gained by reviewing your patient's um, records, 
and understanding exactly what type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma your patient has. For example, a patient with known involvement of the colon may complain of acute abdominal pain. The patient most likely would have abdominal pain or abdominal guarding and an enlarged and tympanic abdomen. This could indicate a bowel perf and would be considered a medical emergency. Your patient with a Burkitt's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma who is starting chemotherapy would be at a very high risk for tumor lysis syndrome and would have to be have frequent laboratory parameters drawn and monitored while maintained on strict intake and output. Please review the cancer-related therapies and side effects that were discussed in your oncology and cancer chapter. The patient who's undergoing external beam radiation therapy has very special nursing needs. Helping the patient and family understand the disease, treatment, and expected potential untoward side effects is essential. Again, fertility issues can be of major concern when you're talking about younger patients. Also, as in Hodgkin's lymphoma, evaluation of the patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma for the long-term effects of therapy is important because of the delayed consequences of disease and treatment may not become apparent for several years. When you're um, reviewing um, in cha the chapter on oncology and the radiation and the effects, again, the external beam, we're talking about the skin issues. Um, please review that and what the proper um, teaching is for patients who are undergoing um, external beam radiation. We're now going to talk about multiple myeloma. Um, this is a disease in which you have neoplastic plasma cells which actually infiltrate the bone marrow and destroy bone. Um, it is twice as common in men and it usually occurs after the age of 40. The cause is unknown, but risk factors include exposure to radiation, pesticides, those who were exposed to Agent Orange, and possibly viral exposure and chronic immune stimulation. The incidence is increased among those who work on a farm, who work with petroleum, wood, and leather workers, and it is high amongst African Americans. It is a illness that develops slow and insidiously. Symptoms do not appear until the disease is advanced. Skeletal pain is the major manifestation. Pelvic, spine, and rib pain are the most common. Osteolytic lesions are seen in the skull, ribs, and vertebra with ensuing compression of the spinal cord with collapse. Loss of bone integrity can lead to pathologic fractures for your patient. Bone degeneration can cause loss of calcium, which leads to hypercalcemia, which can cause renal, GI, or neurological manifestations such as polyuria, anorexia, confusion, and ultimately seizures, coma, and cardiac problems. High protein levels can result in renal failure from renal tubular obstruction and intestinal, oh, excuse me, interstitial nephritis. The patient may also have problems with anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia, which are related to the replacement of the normal bone marrow with plasma cells. This is just an um, example of an x-ray of a patient's proximal humerus. The darkened area is actually um, the myeloma or the um, osteolytic lesion um, on the x-ray that you're seeing there that has the arrow pointing. Um, collaborative diagnosis and staging. Um, the blood work is going to reveal an anemia. You're going to see hypercalcemia, very elevated calcium levels on your patient and elevated serum total protein. Serum and urine electrophoresis with immunofixation can confirm the presence of M protein. Um, in the urine, this is known as Bence, B-E-N-C-E, Jones protein. 
Bone lesions are best detected with skeletal surveys or through MRI. Bone marrow biopsy will show malignant plasma cells giving a definitive diagnosis. In staging of myeloma, it can be based on one of two methods. The first is by looking at the amount of M protein in urine or blood, calcium and hemoglobin levels, the number of bone lesions, and renal function. The second is based on serum levels of albumin and beta-2 macroglobin present. Multiple myeloma is seldom cured, but treatable. We can relieve the symptoms. For early stages, we use corticosteroids. We can use chemotherapy, some biologic therapy, and stem cell transplant may be used. Ambulation and hydration are used to treat hypercalcemia, dehydration, and potential renal damage. Weight bearing helps the bones resorb some of the calcium, and fluids dilute calcium and prevent protein precipitants from causing renal tubular obstruction. Analgesics, orthopedic supports, and localized radiation help with the skeletal pain. Relieving pain, preserving or restoring neurological function, and maintaining spine stability, and controlling tumor growth are the key goals. Patients may take acetaminophen, opioids, anti-seizure medications, or tricyclic antidepressants for pain. Pathologic fractures are a risk, and patients need to be cautious when moving and ambulating. Also, as the disease progresses, and if your patient becomes unable to ambulate, precautions need to be taken when assisting them in turning, as sometimes pathologic fractures can occur from simple movement or pulling on the patients. Anemia can be treated with the use of erythropoietin or epigen. This can help decrease the need for transfusions. It is important to teach the patient how to recognize signs and symptoms of infection. These patients should always get pneumococcal vaccines and annual influenza vaccines. Patients need to stay hydrated and avoid nephrotoxic agents to help prevent worsening of kidney function. These are the patients that do not need to take NSAIDs such as ibuprofen, um, anything that is more um, kidney um, or can cause any kidney toxicity or nephrotoxicity. Uh, mild hypercalcemia is treated with increased fluid intake and weight bearing. Serum calcium levels greater than 13.5 call for immediate treatment with biphosphonates, corticosteroids, IV hydration, and diuretics. Plasmapheresis can decrease serum viscosity in an emergency when needed. Hydration is very important, again, to minimize problems from hypercalcemia. IV fluids may be administered to attain a urinary output of one and a half to two liters per day. Although tumor lysis is rare, once chemotherapy is initiated, allopurinol may be given to help prevent any renal damage that can occur.